Church Morning City Life. I want to start today by taking you back to January 27th, 2012. I only remember the specific date because it was the day before Anne's birthday. And I had been planning to propose to Anne on her birthday. I had this idea, I was going to see her. And then the night before, overnight, leading into the 28th, I wake up in my room, living in my parents' house. I wake up and I feel, I feel a little strange and I try and look around and I can't really tell you which way was up and which way was down. I could feel the bed underneath me, but still I, I couldn't visually tell you where I was or what was happening. I started was feeling a little nauseous, but you know, it was still okay. I sat, I tried to sit up, and it was kind of a struggle, uh, but I had just woken up, so I still was trying to wake up and see what was happening to me. I stood up to go to the bathroom. I was like, okay, let's go, let me go to the bathroom. And I stood up, and I don't even take, I, I think I took one step, and I just collapsed on the floor. I just completely collapsed, sprawled out on the floor, still not really knowing what was happening. I just couldn't tell you what was, hap what was going on, why I couldn't see anything, and um, why I was feeling a bit nauseous. So I crawled, like, I don't know, 20 feet to the bathroom, where the nausea really started to kick in, and I just <laughs> got to the toilet as fast as I could. And for the first time since I was a little kid, I just remember calling for my mommy and daddy, and I was like, Mom, Dad, in the middle of the night. This was in the middle of the night. I had no idea what was happening. All I know is I couldn't stop, sorry, excuse me, but throwing up in the toilet. And I was calling for my mommy and daddy like I had it in a long time and not knowing what was happening. I remember my dad picking me up, physically picking me up and taking me down the stairs. I remember throwing up all over him. Sorry, dad. Um, and they called an ambulance. The only thing I really remember about the ambulance was them saying, he's just probably high, he's probably, this is probably just a bad high. And I was like, no, I'm not high, I'm not high. Because they were just being, I was so dizzy and I had no idea what was happening. And I was just like, please slow down, I can't, like, I don't know what's happening. And they're like, no, he's probably just high, let's take him in. And from that point on, I really don't remember much for about two to three days. I just, I missed the proposal, I missed Anne's birthday. I remember seeing her, but I, I really only have glimpses of the next 48 hours. And what I had learned was that my body had gone through an attack and I was going through an episode of vertigo. And in that time, in that season, this, this episode lasted for weeks. Uh, I couldn't walk normally for months. And I remember allowing God to teach me an important lesson about balance. Now, I hope and I pray that the, our life's difficulties, we allow to speak spiritual truths to, to our souls. And so the very physical lesson here about balance, I, allowed, I asked God to teach me a very spiritual lesson about balance in my life, about being a balanced person. And that's the heart of what we're talking about today. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Pedro Reese, and I'm the lead pastor here at City Life. We love this community. We've been remote for almost a year now. Uh, I love that God is still alive and active in our church. I love that we are still a community pursuing Him, and we are actually in the third week of our new sermon series called The Mystery Series where we're looking at Ephesians, and we're talking about the mysteries of, of God's plan in Christ of the mystery of his will, of his calling, of his election, of his adoption. And today we're going to introduce a couple of really important, again, theological truths, fundamental truths that we're supposed to stand on and live every part of our lives through. But really we're talking about balance today. Balance between two things. Paul finishes with what we talked about last week, the, the golden chain with many links, it's just this beautiful, ongoing sentence in the Greek where he's just so overwhelmed with the mystery, the depth, the beauty of Christ and what he did and what he offers to the world. 
where he just couldn't stop himself from going, going in and going in and going at it, telling everyone that he can in Ephesus and in the Asian church at the time about what Christ did for them and the reality and the truth of what he offers. He just could not stop. And then all of a sudden, he talks about the Holy Spirit, and then he starts to talk about his prayer for the church, for his prayer in the church in Asia, in Ephesus. And he talks about this, about living a balanced life between the knowledge of God and the experience of God. I wonder if you've ever met these types of people, either like the, the person who calls himself a spirit person, right? Which is not a bad thing. We all should be spirit people. I, that is one of my long, longing goals for this church is that we are a church who experiences the spirit all the time. But have you ever met the person who is just all Holy Spirit at all points? I have. I've worked with some and I've tried to disciple some. And often what we see in the life of the person who just only cares about spiritual experiences, experiencing the next spiritual high, is that they usually have a shallow understanding of their faith. And they usually leave a wake of hurt people behind them. Because it's all about the experiencing the Holy Spirit. But then I've also met and been around and worked with and lived with people who are so smart in the Lord who know everything there is to know about it. The German theologian who spoke to us 150 years ago, they can recite to you everything uh, that they've ever learned, but yet it does little to speak to them about how to live out this calling, of how to live in God's blessing right now, about how the importance of not just knowing the Lord up here, but having him move your soul and your spirit and have these encounters with him and encounters with the kingdom of darkness where Jesus always wins. And so we're talking about balance today. Balance in our mystery series. Balance between knowledge, that is so important, and opening up our hearts and experiencing this call in this life. And so we're going to be reading out of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 to 23. But before we even get there, let's pray. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit will be doing both for us. It is my hope that God has put it on my heart for this sermon series to be one that we, we lay out fundamental theological truths and let those truths change the way we think because the way we think dictates the way we live. But then also that we have, uh, all going with it, is this experience of knowing Christ, of feeling these theological truths in our heart, letting them change our hearts. And so let's pray to allow the Holy Spirit to do that a little bit more today, to have that, that, um, the, our permission to work on our hearts and our heads at the same time. So let's, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all my brothers and sisters. I thank you that you've kept us another week. I thank you that we are found in you, that in you everything makes sense, Lord, that in you everything comes together, that ultimately everything is headed towards you whether we know it or not, Lord. Thank you for being the center of everything. Thank you for uh, caring so much about our whole being that you call every part of us to be balanced in our pursuit of you. I thank you that you care for our hearts and our minds at the same time. Lord, uh, help us to be balanced people, people who are grounded in our experiences and in our knowledge of who you are. Lord, I, we give you permission to come and speak to our minds and our hearts this morning. Continue to massage away all the wounds that we carry in our heart and in our souls, Lord, and undo or reaffirm the, the truths that we know in our head that are true, that are biblical, that are grounded in the story that you've told. Lord, we love you. We give you permission to speak to us this morning in a powerful way. Lord, pray all these things in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Amen. So let's read our word for today, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 to 23. God's word says this, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him 
who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might? That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, and power, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I love what Paul is doing here. I love how he is flowing in this, how the Holy Spirit is inspiring the writing of this. He continued on with the link, the golden link that we talked, the golden chain that we talked about last week, right? Some familiar themes that I hope you have dug into your heart in a new place since we started this uh, series. He he starts talking about this inheritance that we've been predestined, which we've been talking about election and having been called, and that we are the first ones to hope in in his glory. And then he turns and he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And we need to start here because all of this balanced living, everything about living this out is rooted in the Holy Spirit. And in verse 13, he's in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, in Jesus, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of your inheritance until you acquire possession of it. If you note here, I think most, a lot of Bibles now will have a note under the word guarantee because another also adequate translation of this can be a down payment. And I love that picture that Jesus came down here, that he lived his perfect life as God and as man. And he did this and he died and he resurrected and he also left because his sacrifice was this down payment. And what was this down payment for? Until his kingdom comes in its fullness, it's that we can live with the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is a down payment, the first glimpse of this eternal life, of the kingdom coming in its fullness And that is offered to all the saints. And we have to start here because, church, you and I, when you say yes to the whole, yes to Jesus, you're given the Holy Spirit. We live and we're different. We're fundamentally different and we're not called to live this life on our own because even in our own spirit, we are purchased and bought and given the Holy Spirit as a sign of assurance. Assurance is another big theological word that I want us to be so familiar with from here on out, that you don't have to live your life in fear over your salvation. That if you are in Christ, if you confess with your mouth and with your life that Christ is Lord and that you want your life to emulate His life and you want the Holy Spirit to continue to work in your life, making you more like Christ, then we have been given assurance against fear, that we don't have to live our whole lives turning over every salvation stone. Am I saved today? Oh, I did this. Am I saved today? Oh, am I, I did this again. Oh, am I saved again? No, but if you confess Christ and if you find your life in Christ, if you put yourself up to Christ and say, every time I'm coming back, I'm repenting. I'm trying to look like you. I want your Holy Spirit. If you know the Holy Spirit and his voice in your heart, If you live out of his power, if you pursue the things that scripture tells you to pursue, then you have this assurance. And you don't have to live your life out of fear that God's going to turn his back on you or that one day you'll find that you've been disqualified. 
but you have this assurance that you have been bought with a price, that you are a part of the church, Christ's bride. So let that, let that assurance, sweet assurance, speak peace and rest over your soul, that if you confess Jesus and make your life about him, that you don't have to be afraid of, of your relationship with the Lord. And so we have to start there because Paul then starts talking about this balanced life. And this balanced life is only found when we live it in the Holy Spirit. But he starts praying over this. He says, you know, I've heard about your love towards all this. I've heard about your faith. And so I, I don't cease to giving thanks for you. And then in verse 17, he starts to lay out this prayer for these group of Christians, for the church in Ephesus and in Asia Minor. And he says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what it is to hope. And so first here we see this relationship between revelation and knowledge. His prayer for this church and, and for us is that we will always be ever increasing in two things. In our knowledge of God, that we would let these spiritual truths not just be, okay, we read this, I did my devotion, oh, this is sweet, but it's not really going to impact me. But no, that we like really get this information in and we let it change the way we think and the way we live. But then also that the, that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened and opened. And we know that in biblical literature, the heart is more than just this beating thing, but it's the center of our whole being. It's the center of our soul. It's the image that the innermost part of you, the part of you that you know is truest, where you have all of your secrets, where you have all of your ambitions, where you have your hurts and your wounds, where you find your character. All of this is found in the heart, and we should have this knowledge and be gaining more knowledge, but that we should also have our hearts open to experiencing the Lord the God who has dominion over this life, it says here, but we'll get that in a second. This life and the next one, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. And that this balance between this knowledge and experience, this knowledge and living it out, this knowledge that is so important, but that doesn't just stop in our heads, but that influence the way we live and that we would also be seeking spiritual experiences that when power and counter experiences come between uh, us and the kingdom of darkness that we would be know, having this truth in our mind to change our experiences. And so th then Paul says, you know, three things come out of this balanced life. Three things is what he prays over the church in Ephesus. Hope to which he has called you. The second, that you know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And then third, that we would know the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. And so let's start there. Let's talk about these three things and how these are powerfully changed the way that we can live balanced lives in the Holy Spirit. Let's start with the first one, about the hope we have in our calling. I love the fact that the Holy Spirit used Paul to write so much of the New Testament because when Paul writes about something here, you can count that he's written about it somewhere else. And we've been talking about call, about election, about how before the foundations of creation, before time even began, when God lived outside of time still and he was just in his trinity, before all that he elected us in Christ, that he made his mind up and his heart up, that we would find him in Christ. And then Paul, over and over again in the New Testament, just keeps writing about that. And he brings another angle, a new angle that we haven't talked about, another huge theological distinction that we have to drill into our hearts and in our heads this morning. And it's this. Let's turn to Romans 8, verse 30. God's word here says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. We've been talking about calling. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I do also want to remind us of what we've been talking about last week, that this calling also comes with two responsibilities. 
with the responsibility of, of living holy lives will never be perfect, but the pursuit of living holy lives, lives that please the Lord, like James say, this is true religion, and do everything that he says, that that is her outlook at life, that grace, election, assurance, justification, none of this is permission to sin, but it's motivation and gratitude to be like, Lord, you did so much to me, I want to live as holy as I can. I want to experience you now. That's part of the balance. I want to know you here and experience a life that is full of you today. And it also comes with a call to fellowship. Never in scripture does it talk about our salvation and it's not followed at some point afterwards by our call to love and live with one another. Read First John and you can't escape the fact that if you don't love and live with your neighbors here, then how can you know Christ the call to the justification also comes with the call to be holy and the call to live with your neighbors. And so a balanced life is this, that we let justification feel, feed our minds and say, oh, Lord, what, what, what is the limit of what we can accomplish if we know that we're justified? And also, Lord, how do I live out this justification? Let this peace wash over me. And not live in fear and not live that I have to live up to you or do what you tell me to or else you're going to turn your back on me. No, but we've been justified. And because we've been justified, Paul also, the Holy Spirit also wants us to know about the glory of our inheritance. Let's read uh, Romans again. Same chapter, chapter 8. Read the whole thing. It's quite remarkable. Read all of Romans. Read all of the Bible. But really, start with Romans. Romans is beautiful. If you want to grow in your understanding of what Christ did, read Romans. But let's, for now, just start with two verses. One verse. Even simpler. Romans 8, verse 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I love the scripture that the Lord has the audacity to say to us. That if we are in Christ, if we make everything about who we are. If we accept the salvation and redemption that he offers. And that only he offers. Then God has the audacity to look at us and say, you know what? You are co-heirs with Christ. What an act of grace. What an act of mercy that we did not deserve. And so uh, our inheritance, we've been talking about it for a few weeks here, and I fully expect inheritance to be something that is always so beyond the limits of human thinking, that we don't deserve this, that we'll never fully grasp what this means except for one thing, when we see Christ face to face. Let's read 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. Beloved, We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. I love how scripture goes here. I, I, I love how big of a picture our inheritance is to God. And one of the things, our inheritance is ultimately when we see him face to face. When we see him and when we're in his presence fully, undiluted, somehow scripture promises us that even just being in his presence will fill every crack that we've ever had or we've ever gained, we've ever created in ourselves. That one day we will come face to face with him. Is there anything more beautiful in our future than seeing Christ face to face? I love, one of the ancient words that I love talking about the most is the word sincere. Sincere in the Greek means without wax. And here's the picture. This is what the picture of the word sincere is. Sincere uh, is like a potter. A potter who makes pots and puts it in the fire to harden, to be usable, to be strong. And as quite often happens, I took two years of pottery in high school, so I'm kind of an expert. Not, I'm just kidding. Um, but what happens is that there are air bubbles in the, pot, in the clay at times. And then when put under the fire, these expand and blow up. But every once in a while, it doesn't completely break, but it just chips or there's a hole here. 
And then so an excellent craftsman will throw this away because it's unusable. It's not worth the name of his product. But then for people who need, who just need to sell this, people who have to make money off of this, what they would do in the ancient world is they would get wax and cover up the holes and the wax filled the holes so perfectly that only a really trained eye could see the quality of a, of a masterpiece and of a chipped, broken, not very useful jar. And this is the, I love that this is the picture that First John talks about, that our inheritance when we see him will be that every one of our holes will be filled. That every crack that we have that life gave us, every crack that relationships put in us, every time that we've accepted in a lie, every harm that we've ever done to ourselves, when we see Christ face to face, when we're in the place that he reigns completely, all of those holes will be filled. His very presence, the very fact of seeing our maker, the one who created all of this, will make us whole and cover every hole. And the other promise that we have in Scripture, along with this, is once again that our inheritance will also be undefiled fellowship with one another. That when we are made whole, when we are all made whole, when we live in His kingdom and His presence, then there will be nothing to hurt one another with. There will be nothing, no lack that we'll need to fill in illegitimate ways. Just like always in Scripture, it's always Christ being so filled and loving with Christ and then living with one another. I love how Scripture always goes there. I love how our inheritance is Christ himself. That, I said this last week, that heaven isn't just heavenly because it's this perfect place, but no, it's perfect because Christ is there. That every time he faced leopards, instead of them making him sick, his health made them healthy. That's what it was. That is what ultimately our inheritance is going to, inheritance is going to be, being made whole by Christ. But then we have a new idea. Paul takes us into a new journey here, and he starts talking about his power. And I'm, let's, let's dive into his power. I'm so excited to talk about this part. We're talking about the greatness of his power. For this, let's turn back to our portion here in Ephesians, Ephesians 1, and let's start reading at verse 19 to the end. Paul writes this, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above every rule and authority, power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Again, that idea of filling all in all, I love that. But let's talk about his power for a second. Let's just reflect on, I, I don't know if I have the right, the best words for this yet. I, I still, I've been so blown away with this of trying to really dissect this for myself. And so I'll do my best here and over the next couple of weeks, like, Lord, please help us to understand his power. But I want to start here. We don't just believe in this Bible. We don't believe in this story. We don't believe in Christ just because it's nice. We don't believe, again, I think I already said this, we don't believe in the gospel just because it's like the, what the triumph of the human spirit can accomplish or what good in the world can do. No, we, we don't believe this story. We don't believe any of this just because it's a perfectly told story, even though it is. But the reason why we believe in this story is because this is true. Because this took place. Because the men and the women who took care of God's word over the generations protected the words that we see here, protected the telling of God. So the gospel writers interviewed people. Some were there themselves, and so they had all these experiences, but there's a lot of work that went into preserving this story because it's a true story. We believe in this historical man who came, who was more than just a man. He was clearly more than just one of us, but he was also one of us, and he lived this life where nobody could throw a stone at him 
and yet he, was, he came, he called himself the Lord. He, he did all these things that people, we just cannot do on ourselves. He did all these things that the kingdom of darkness would never do against itself. And then he, he died a death that he didn't deserve. And then all these eyewitnesses of, of living life with him, of people feeding him afterwards, and then him ascending back to heaven and telling us that he'll be back. We believe in this story because we believe it's true. And the reason why that is so important it is because if this is true, then God has to be all-powerful. Then God has to be who he says, that Christ actually did rise from the dead, that the same spirit who lives in us raised Christ from the dead. And then he raised him from the dead, and then God took him and seated him at the right hand above every power. The powers here that are listed are in every spiritual realm far above every rule and authority, power and dominion, and above every name that is named, that is both natural, above every natural power, above creation, then also above every human power or name, above every government, above everything that the human might can accomplish, or everything that the human will, and also dominion and authority above every spiritual realm, above every other kingdom, above the kingdom of darkness, above any kingdom that we try and build our, on our own. God, Jesus has been placed above every single one of those because he is strong. And then lastly, that, he made, that God made him head over the church. Three important things connected to God's strength that we would know the unmatched strength and power in the Lord. And we got to talk about this on two different levels, a private level and then a public level for this to make sense. Let's start with the private. Privately, what does this mean? What does acknowledging and growing in the balance of knowing God's strength, what does that really mean? That if we believe in this story, then we live out of the supernatural strength that God provides. That everything about my I'm like, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you to come and fill the holes. I need your spiritual power to ground me, to give me boldness, to give me courage, to produce miracles in my life, that we are aligned to the one who, cre- who performed miracles left and right. In all of his story, God works through the world, the, through the natural order of things, and then also supernaturally to bring miracles, that we are aligned to that same person, that we are aligned to the person who went to Everyone that he encountered in his ministry, he made them more whole. Everyone who was seeking him, at least, not those who are opposed to him. He made people whole. And he fills our, our, our souls in areas that, you know, if we were honest, we know that we could never bring healing to. We know that we all have these places in our souls where we're desperate because we know nothing we can do can really bring healing there. But we are found in the one who is all powerful to bring healing. We're, we're aligned to the one who performed miracles, and every time he pronounced healing over someone, they were healed. That there was no sickness that Christ couldn't speak into and completely heal. There was not a single person who was brought to Jesus who he did not heal. His dominion over the physical world. But that there was also a Every person, every demon that he ever spoke to did exactly what he said. Had to listen to him. Had to bend their will to him, even though they opposed him and hated him in every way. That every spiritual battle that Jesus waged, he won. Usually in the most backward way that we could have imagined it, but he always won. Every demon listened to his words. And that we're aligned to the one who, who spoke everything into being that we would know the greatness of God's strength and let that produce something in our hearts and in our lives to like, oh my, Lord, then what can I accomplish in this world? I don't want to hold you back. I'm talking about this balance between living this out, feeling it and experiencing and also knowing, Lord, I've read this, I've known this, now I want to live this out. I want to see your miracles happen. I want to be healed as well. This reminds me, all week this has reminded me of a story. Back uh, when I was a kid, my, I, an uncle, an uncle and an aunt and a couple cousins lived near us. And one year they opened up a restaurant. Uh, it's called Cafe Brasil. And we lo- I loved going there. 
And on the opening night, me, my cousin, and a friend were having this argument. Our cousin obviously won, because the argument was whose dad was more influential here, right? My cousin, obviously, his dad was the owner, so we're not arguing with him. But I remember my friend was saying, you know what, my dad was the head carpenter. He built all of this. Like, he, he was a part of all this. He's so important, I can come in here anytime I want. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. slow down for a second. He's my family, you know that, right? My dad is his brother, you know that, right? So, like, I can come in here, I can put my feet up wherever, I can go to the freezer right now and take an ice cream, and no one's going to stop me. And in my head, I've just been reminded about this story, and I'm like, man, if we only lived like we knew our father was the strongest one on the block, like if we only lived like we act, like if we really believed, if we let all of this truth come in and inform the way that we like, there is absolutely nothing that can stop our Lord. Yeah, we were gonna have to, we're called to suffer with him, to know Christ and his suffering. So our whole life won't just be this per, uh, victory parade all the time. But you know that there's actually nothing that's going to stop what God told me is going to happen. But there's no spiritual power, natural power, no human agenda that can ever slow down what the Lord is doing. If, if we live like that in our private lives, then man, what could we do in our public lives? And so let's go there. Let's, let's transition to our public life right now. That if we as a church and as God's people, who our head is Jesus himself, that if we lived our lives with this type of confidence and publicly proclaimed to everyone, you know, there's this man, he came, he was born in Bethlehem, Jesus of Nazareth. He lived this perfect life. No one could ever fault him for doing anything wrong. And then he died a death that he didn't deserve. And he actually, you know what? He actually rose up from the dead. Isn't that weird? Isn't that crazy? That doesn't happen. And that afterwards, people, all these hordes of people spent time with him and ate with him and, and touched his body. And then he went up to heaven and told us to wait for him and to live out our lives with the Holy Spirit and bring other people to him. You know, you know this actually is real, right? This isn't a myth. This isn't a legend. My Lord and Savior is living in heaven right now, and he's never tasted death again. And he offers that and salvation to everyone. Like if we only let this, <laughs> all our calling, our inheritance, inform the balanced life that we could have to actually proclaim, proclaim this publicly, what would stand in our way as a church? Uh, John Stott, the, the guy I've been reading, he wrote this, and I just absolutely loved it. He said, the resurrection and ascension were a decisive demonstration of divine power. For if there are two powers in which man cannot control, but which hold him in bondage, they are death and evil. But God in Christ conquered both, and therefore can rescue us from both. It's like, what if we publicly de declared that everywhere that we went? What if we were a group of people that actually lived like we believe this, not accusing us, but I'm like, well, what would stop us? What could stand in our way in the long run? Like, Christ has <laughs> demonstrated this publicly to the world. It has already happened. And it's up to us to live this balanced life and say, Lord, I've read about what ha how strong you are. And now I want to experience it. I want to bring that healing, those miracles. I want to see you casting out demons in our community so that we can publicly live like this and tell everyone about it. So that our church would grow, not because we're accumulating angry Christians from other churches, though we'll do that as well and bring healing into their lives. But no, we're growing because of people confessing Christ for the first time ever. That we would live these balanced lives, lives that like uh, represented what we really believe. And I don't mean any of this to be accusatory. I'm a fallen person just like all of us. I'm being redeemed just like all of us. Like, what, what would stop us, church, if we lived like this? And so we've been called. We've been shown glimpses of what our inheritance ultimately will be. And now we also see that and accept that we are aligned with the most powerful one in the world, in all of creation. And so let's conclude this a little bit to make some sense out of it. 
we started the morning talking about balance. Now Paul talks about the Holy Spirit. You know, it's our down payment. You have assurance of this life if you know and are growing in relationship with the Holy Spirit and following what he's telling you, knowing his nudges and how he speaks to you, then you have assurance that you belong to Christ. Don't live your life out of fear. And that that assurance gives us room to say, you know what, I need to learn in here and I need this to grow up as well. I need to experience all of this because just knowing this won't really help me. Or just feeling good at certain times, that won't help me. I'll have a very shallow grave if, if that is the case. But I need to be this balanced person, this person that takes in truth and, and lives it out as well. Every soul that has ever lived has craved Jesus. That is a truth. Every soul that has ever been put on this planet has craved Jesus. And so they long to see balanced lives, lives that actually believe in Christ, that follow what he says. And so church, if we're balanced in our approach to say, Lord, teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. I want to know more, but I have to dive into your word. I, I want to be in love with what you say, the story you tell. I need to know it. But then also, Lord, I, you like, let, let me experience this. Let me pray for someone and then be healed. Let me see a miracle happen. Let me just like utterly tell everyone about how strong you really are. And, and then we'll get to this point where we're like casting out demons left and right because that's what you do everywhere that you go. And it's about this balance, that a Christian life is about this balance of knowing and doing, of learning and living out. And so I just have this long list, like last questions, like what would, what would stop us from accomplishing our vision? Then we would, could never dream up a big enough dream to keep up with what the Lord could do. And so let's just take this and see how this unfolds in our mystery series in Ephesians. See where Paul takes it from here. Say, you know, with, with the light, this balanced life, you know, take it into here. Take it into here. And so let's continue to go to the Word, go to this marvelous book and say, Lord, mold us, make us look like you. Let these deep fundamental truths change everything about how we live. And so pretty soon we're going to be joining our big Zoom call but before that, let, let's get into some prompt questions that we have. This week we're doing our prompt questions a little bit different. But here, here's the first one. Here's the first question. Do you understand what assurance means and do you feel it over your life? This is another not, you can give me a Sunday school answer, but it won't really help you. Do you really get that you can live your life with this confidence that you are saved? And has that really sunk in yet? And does it affect the way that you live your life? Does it generate boldness in you or excitement or passion? Prompt question number two. Do you feel you live a balanced life between knowing and experiencing Jesus in your calling, your inheritance, and in his power? These three things that we talked about. Like do, you, do you know it more than you felt it or experienced it? Or have you experienced it more than you know it? I think it's important for us to know where we're deficient in so that we can live a balanced life. And if you're balanced, praise God, stand in that, be happy about that. But let's answer this question together. And our last one is a little different. I'm going to read a statement, and in the call, you just have to react to it with someone. This is a statement. I know a lot about Christ, but I don't think I've had spiritual experiences. I've had plenty of spiritual experiences, but I'm shallow in my understanding of him and what he did in his life. Or, I feel balanced in how I know him and how I experience his power. Have, have you had spiritual experiences in your life that you point to and say, oh, this, this had to have been God? Or has your experience with the Lord been like just super intellectual or in your mind? Again, we just need, we need to know because... The fullness, God has a fullness of life for us to live. 
And so, church, I love you. We love you. I'll see you on the Zoom call in just a moment. Join us. The link will be on the bottom here. Let's get together. We're going to be speed dating a little bit, getting to know other people in our church. And so if this is your first time here, join the call. It might seem overwhelming to see all these people, but please, please come on the call. We would love for you to come here. We're going to break up into smaller groups, so it won't be quite as intimidating. But please reach out to us. We love all of you. We'll see you in our MCs this week. Let's remain connected. Let's be a body together for Christ. I love you all. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, church.